Welcome to the Duke Lemur Center, home to more than 200 lemurs from 14 different species, the most diverse population of lemurs anywhere on the globe outside their native Madagascar. Founded in 1966 on 85 acres in Duke Forest, this center is a conservation compound dedicated to the preservation and study of lemurs. Why do lemurs need protection? They're the most endangered mammals on the planet. There are 100 plus species of lemurs, only found native on the island of Madagascar, and 95% of those are endangered, and a third of them are considered critically endangered. With me today is Faye Goodwin. She's a lead education specialist here at the Duke Lemur Centre, and she's going to be our guide through today's feeding session. We're going to observe a feeding, learn a little bit more about the lemurs, and find out more about the work here at the centre and how all of us can help. Faye. Uh, I see that around us we've got some, uh, some lemurs already here ready for feeding. Can you tell us a little bit about this particular species? Absolutely, Greg. These are the cockerel shifak, and you might have seen them bouncing around. They're really anticipating their morning feeding. We have a family of three here this morning. We've got the matriarch um, lupicina, lupa, lupi for short, and then we've got dad, Gabe, short for elagabalus, and then little baby Felix, who was just born in December and we can learn more about those individuals later on. With Shafak, hopefully we've been able to see some of their incredible locomotion. Hopefully we'll get another glimpse of that later on today. But this is a vertical clinging and leaping species. So they're actually bipedal like us, and hopefully we'll be able to see them doing their really unique leaping through the trees and across the ground as well. Fantastic. Now, of course, we're outside, but as you can see, we're still wearing masks. Can you tell us why that's important for the protection of the lemurs? Absolutely, and I appreciate everyone wearing masks uh, when they've come to visit here. Lemurs are part of the primate family, so a lot of folks equate them to monkeys. They are actually not monkeys, but close relatives of monkeys, the earliest primates that ever showed up on Earth. So as part of the primate family, which they share with humans, lemurs can catch a lot of the same illnesses that humans do. So we are being extra careful and extra cautious to make sure that they don't get any of our diseases, especially COVID. And what we're hearing right now is actually an alarm call from the rough lemur species. That's another one we're going to be meeting today. And they can be heard about a half mile away. So if we're hearing that on camera, that is their alarm call. And they talk about what's going on in the forest all day. And we're seeing some lemurs approaching us right now. So Faye and I are going to continue to walk while you guys get to watch the lemurs as they arrive for their feed. Now, Faye, I mentioned a few moments ago that uh, lemurs are the most endangered mammals on the planet. We know that they're found natively only in Madagascar. Why are lemurs so endangered? What are some of the factors that are threatening them? Yeah, so the number one threat to lemurs right now is deforestation in Madagascar. And the majority of deforestation um, is a result of uh, Madagascar being one of the 10 poorest nations in the world. So there's pretty rampant poverty on the island. And people are really just trying to find any way they can to survive and feed their families. So the majority of people in Madagascar are subsistence farmers. They're trying to farm the land to feed themselves and their families. And so the method of agriculture that's used is called slash and burn. And this is a pretty destructive method of agriculture that is no longer really able to be done sustainably with the high populations that we're currently seeing. So deforestation is number one. There are, of course, other factors that contribute to deforestation, like large mining operations. Lemurs are also, as you can see, so cute that they are uh, unfortunately a victim of the pet trade. Some people do uh, extract them from the wild to, use, uh, to sell as pets. Um, and there is some bushmeat hunting in some areas as well, but I'd say deforestation is number one. Sure, absolutely, thank you. So we can see these shifaks going to town here on, on breakfast, mm -hmm. um, or maybe it's closer to lunch for them. Tell us what they like to eat, and what's actually in these bowls that they're feeding on right now? Absolutely, Greg. So you mentioned that there were over 100 different species of lemur, and Madagascar is an amazingly diverse place. You can imagine every different species kind of has their own specialized diet. And we go one step further here at the Duke Lemur Center, and every individual has their own diet plan. And that's dependent on what species they are, but also their age, their personal wellness, and their needs. So shifak are found in the dry deciduous forest in Madagascar, which is really similar to the Duke Forest here. And they are folivores, or leaf eaters. So you'll see uh, we have Gabe here right in the front, um, Luffy in the middle, and Felix uh, on the far side. And Gabe especially is showing us that he's got a really leafy breakfast this morning, but he is going for a cashew right there. So Shifak are eating really high fiber, leafy, vegetative diets. Um, not a lot of fruit. The fruit can actually ferment in their belly and make them sick. So they get leafy greens, veggies, beans, or nuts every day. And they also get a primate chow that's specific to their dietary needs. 
So for the Shafak, that's a full of chow, really high in fiber. Sure, a high fiber diet with lots of leafy greens. I think uh, us as people could probably <laughs> take a leaf out of their books. I need to remember these lemurs next time I go to the grocery store and I'm mm -hmm. looking at the salad greens and maybe take those before I head to the snack aisle. Anyway, um, <laughs> So you say, these are, these are adorable animals. And what's fascinating to me is that on Madagascar, you've got more than 100 different species of lemur mm -hmm. that have evolved there. And I gather from my research that Madagascar separated from the Indian subcontinent about 88 million years ago, which is why their wildlife was able to evolve in isolation. But do we know much about how so many different species of lemur were able to uh, evolve in one particular location? It's such an amazing question to ask. And, and I'll sort of refer to the fact that the Duke Lemur Center is primarily a non-invasive research center. So these are the kinds of questions we're aiming to answer, not only with our very cute live population here, but also with the fossil division that studies the natural history of lemurs. So one of the major factors in the diversity of lemurs and their adaptive radiation is the diversity of Madagascar itself and sort of the coincidental nature of how mammalian life um, evolved on the island. So you mentioned Madagascar has been an island for 88 million years. So the animals that were originally on that island were very few and there weren't a lot of large mammals. And then you pair this with the fact that Madagascar has an incredibly diverse ecosystem. We've got tropical rainforest, dry deciduous forest, spiny desert, and savanna, all on one island about the size of California. Faye, if I could pause you just for one sure. second. We've seen here that a squirrel has now <laughs> just kind of basically gate crashed the feeding session. And <laughs> yeah. this, uh, which one, this middle lemur, what's its name again? So that's Gabe, that's the male. Gabe, so Gabe is just like clearly disturbed by this. He's retreated up a tree uh, several feet. <laughs> so is this, I mean, obviously squirrels are native to this area. There's a billion of them around here in Duke Forest. Does this happen a lot? And, you know, obviously we're just watching this happen and now Gabe is returning to his food. Yeah. I mean, do, do, do the squirrels do this a lot? Because we know squirrels can be uh, pretty food aggressive. Absolutely. So the lemurs do share their enclosure with wildlife, and now the squirrels now, going yep, Felix. Yep. And, <laughs> and Felix, that's our newborn. I mean, this is, Felix is a kid, and here he is, you know, wow, this is... Uh, right. So the squirrels, as I'm sure anyone knows who has squirrels in their yard, uh, are very aggressive and will definitely um, try their hand. I don't usually see squirrels being this bold and trying to take food directly from a lemur wow. that's eating. So it kind of depends on the lemur as well. So some lemurs will be more uh, <laughs> protective of their food bowls and will try to chase the squirrel off. Yeah, I've noticed that Felix has now come over here to, to this other bowl mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the larger lemurs kind of just happily retreated up a tree with a leaf. Um, mm -hmm. So th th these particular lemurs are not food aggressive with one another? So they can be, um, and you'll notice that they're, they all have their own little feeding area, and Brittany, the keeper out here, has done that on purpose to give them all their own feeding space. So lemurs are highly female dominant, and depending on the female and depending on the family group, you can get some food aggression, um, particularly the female to the adult male. So Gabe over there, who got the first squirrel attack, um, Gabe is our adult male, so he is the lowest ranking. And you can usually see Loopy, the dominant female, um, go and chase him off of his food bowl. And that's pretty normal behavior. As long as he does what he's supposed to and lets her have it, everything should be pretty harmonious. That's just how it is in the lemur world. We do have a second species out here that is eating in their own private dining room every morning so they don't come and bully these lemurs away from their food. So lemurs can definitely have food territoriality, just like many animals do. So do you, so do you think that um, it's possible that Loopy here has deferred to Felix just because he's young and she figures he might need feeding, or it's just like she's just being really chill about it? She's being really chill. Loopy is, she runs a tight ship, so sure. I was surprised that she uh, got out of the way for Felix. Him being her first baby might have something to do with it, but wow. she is definitely not an indulgent mother, I would say. So I was a little surprised she got out of his way and she might come back for seconds in a little bit. She so, took her leaf to go. <laughs> so you mentioned that Felix is an infant. How old is Felix right now? So Felix was born in December. I believe he was born on the winter solstice or possibly the 31st of December. So Shifak, the cockerel Shifak, which is the species we're with today, um, their baby season is in midwinter. And so their babies will grow up and get just big enough as it starts to get warm to come out in free range. So little Felix did really grow up in this enclosure. So um, you mentioned that Loopy is his mother. How old is, is Loopy? Oh, I would have to check with uh, Loopy's keeper about that specifically, but both Loopy and Gabe are relatively young. If I had to guess, I'd say around five or six years old. Gotcha. Uh, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> no, absolutely. With, with um, uh, obviously, uh, lemurs that are living in a sheltered environment like this, I understand their life expectancy could be different in the wild, but how, how long would you expect a, a typical shifak to live? What's the life expectancy? Yeah, so shifak are a little bit of a, a more 
delicate species because they are such specialized eaters. So in the wild, you might expect a shifak to live about 15 to 18 years, maybe 20 if they're really healthy and lucky. Um, but in, uh, in human care, like in a place like the lemur center, um, we can typically expect a few more years out of a shifak. So mid twenties um, or even to late twenties is, is the expectation for shifak. So you mentioned that, that uh, you know, Lupi is uh, Felix's mother. Is Gabe his father or is this a family unit we're looking at here? It is a family unit. So this is the first infant for both Lupi and Gabe. Um, and of course they're first together. So very exciting for them. Do they, um, uh, when they're here, you know, wandering around freely, do they tend to kind of associate quite fam closely with a family unit or do they have tend to form larger packs in the wild? How does that work? Great question, yeah. So lemurs are very social. What their social group looks like is gonna vary quite a bit by species. And I will sort of amend what I just said because we do have some nocturnal species that are a little more solitary. So like the eye eye or the mouse lemur, they might spend a little more time foraging by themselves. These larger diurnal or daytime active lemurs typically stick together. And that's because when you're this large and you're out in the middle of the day, you might be more of a target to predators if you're by yourself. So they're, they definitely operate as a unit. Now, if you can see all three, you, know, you might have noticed that Luffy has a radio collar on. The rest do not. So her radio collar has a little tracker on it. It helps us keep track of where these folks are in the forest enclosure. Their enclosure, I think, is about three acres in this space. So it's a lot of space if the lemurs are out on their own going around and foraging. So we need to make sure we can locate her. But the two gentlemen are going to stick with her um, pretty, pretty well. So we don't need to have collars on them. Wherever Loopy is, they're going to be close behind. So you mentioned they've got roughly a three acre um, enclosure that they can roam in. But clearly these are, are very uh, mobile creatures bouncing mm. from tree to tree. How do you make sure that they don't roam beyond uh, their, <laughs> their, their, their enclosure? Absolutely. So um, part of it has to do with motivation and the resources available to them. So obviously oh, we got a little female dominance there from Luffy. Wow. And uh, she definitely let Gabe know that she wanted to get whatever was in his bowl. And Taking no prisoners. Absolutely. We'll see what Felix does here if he joins his dad. Um, but back to the question, of course. So the lemurs get breakfast every morning. So their bellies are full. They have no need to uh, wander beyond what we have provided for them in terms of resources. Um, but they, we, we do have the enclosure fully surrounded by a fence. And the top of that fence has some low voltage electrical netting on it. So if a lemur does happen to get curious and they wanna climb up that fence, it does feel a little bit like a bee sting. So most lemurs, that's enough for them to say, oh no, I'd rather go sit in a tree. Um, in addition, we do have to cut back the tree line on either side of that fence because, of course, the shifak are incredible leapers. And right. I'm sure we've seen a bit of that. Absolutely. And they can leap up to 20, even 30 feet in the wild. So we cut that tree line back uh, too far for them to leap across. So to go, we, we took a bunch of tangents from the original question I asked you. Um, yeah. So you were mentioning about Madagascar being roughly the size of California, and mm -hmm. I'm really curious about how so many different species of lemur um, uh, evolved in, in such a small area. And you said this is one of the things you study here. So what, what do we know about that? Right, so we know that, um, our as our best guess indicates, lemurs probably started to show up in Madagascar around 60 million years ago. And when they did arrive on the island of Madagascar, they found an ecosystem that was wide open for the taking. Uh, lots of variability. I mentioned all the different habitat types. Not very many mammals at all. A few bird species, a few reptile species, no large carnivores. So it's kind of like landing in Oz and everything is, sure. is open for the taking. So we get this incredible process of adaptive radiation where all of these lemur species were able to really specialize to these ecosystems because there was really no competition. So it's it's an amazing example of adaptive radiation. It's really textbook. Um, people refer to Darwin's finches in similar ways. You right. really get to see how these animals specialize over time. Um, and we have some potential immigration events later on. We think the ancestor of the modern I.I. came over maybe 20 million years ago. So this is all really cool guesswork and hypothesis coming out of the fossil division of the lemur center to kind of explore how that process occurred. Sure. You mentioned uh, that they're such social creatures. We're seeing something happen right over here. Where uh, Do they seem to be sharing food? What, what, what do you think exactly is happening over here? Absolutely. So dad and son um, are getting along quite well over here. We got the two boys who are, you know, kind of under mom's thumb. Is that right? Or did they switch? No, it's mom and Gabe. I mean, sorry, mom and Felix. So <laughs> they switched places on us. So we've got mom and Felix, Loopy and Felix sharing a bowl together. 
So um, we sort of let mom decide how she wants to raise her kids. Some moms, like, like Loopy, typically run a tight ship. But Felix at this age is young enough to sort of fly under her radar. Once he reaches sexual maturity, around three or four years of age, he might not be able to get away with sharing out of her bowl like he is now. Um, but at this age, you know, he's still her baby. So we've got some nice cooperative feeding going on. Gabe, unfortunately, the dad has to go eat by himself. So we know, I know from looking at the, uh, uh, the Duke Lima website and doing some research, these are very intelligent animals. You mentioned this. I know that you guys have enrichment activities here, although today we're just watching a feeding, not one of those. Can you tell us a little bit about how, through observation, um, we are able to detect that they are especially intelligent and what are some of the kind of activities you do to help keep their brains sharp? Excellent questions. Of course, cognitive research is a huge factor in, in the research that we do here. Definitely an area that folks are very interested in, especially since these are some of the earliest primates on Earth. We want to see how that primate intelligence started to evolve. So um, measuring intelligence is a tricky thing. So it's kind of hard to say how smart a lemur is without comparing them to similar, uh, similar animals. Um, but they do have a really large brain and we do know that they have great problem solving skills, that they have a great deal of social culture. We've done studies about their memory. And when we're looking at enrichment, we're really exercising both the body and the brain as best we can. And what we're seeing out here in the forest is a great example of what we try to simulate when the lemurs are not free ranging. So this is a lot like being in the wild. So our keepers and researchers can observe what these wild behaviors are like out in the forest and then try to recreate them with enrichment indoors. Fantastic, thank you. Now we're seeing here as Loopy and Felix continue to enjoy their breakfast together. Mother, oh, a little bit of tension there. Mother, running a tight ship, as Faye just pointed out to us. Felix just noshing away on a piece of leafy greens. I wish I could get my son to do that. Having said that, that's, that's really unfair. He's, uh, he's a great eater. He'll eat whatever's put in front of him. My daughter's more of a picky eater. Can't get too harsh on her for that though, because I was the same way at her age until I was about 15 and I discovered cheese. Amazing to think one could go 15 years without understanding the joy of cheese. There we are. Okay, we're going to bring in someone else here. Here we have Britt, and uh, Britt, your last name is? Keith. Keith. Right, uh, so Britt is um, basically in charge of the conservation program here, or the, the breeding program, am I right? Sort of, what, it all rolls into one. I'll tell you what, why don't you tell me what you're responsible here <laughs> for the Lima Center so I don't have to try so, and guess and make a fool of myself. Well, my official title is colony curator, and that means uh, managing all the animals, all the family groups, all the social units, all of the behaviors that go into that, all the breeding, who we decide to transfer in or transfer out. Um, and how we manage our colony as a whole, species-wise, and lemur whole-wise. So all of the things that go into that. Sure. So basically, if there was lemur gossip at the lemur center, then you would be the one who knew, right? <laughs> I'd you... probably want to start it. <laughs> <laughs> so I gather that um, Felix is a product of the breeding program he here, is. Uh, here at the, the lemur center. And, and how does that work from year to year? Is there a kind of a standard amount of births that you have here at the center? How is that managed? Well, um, each species throughout the AZA, which is a, the American Zoological Association, in the United States, the Europe has uh, an association similar to it. Other countries have their own associations. But here, the AZA sort of governs all of our species breeding programs. Um, we're not officially a zoo, but we do our best and actually lead a lot of the breeding programs for persimmons because obviously we hold the most persimmons than any other institution in the U.S. So each species has their own stud book, which is their pedigree follows from when the animals came in from the wild, which we call founders, to what you see in front of you today. So we have him going back to his uh, most great, uh, oldest ancestors that came straight out of Madagascar. And those animals are what came in years and years ago, those original founders, and they're no longer living now. That living population just occurs of all of their offspring. And so every year, each species um, goes through what we call a sort of, the, we look at the stud book, we see who's been born, who's died, and then we make <clears throat> uh, recommendations based on the genetic diversity of each individual pairing. And so we want the most distantly related animals to be 
breeding, of course, to remain that high genetic diversity. So I have the pleasure of being the SSP, Species Advisal Program Coordinator for this species. There is 61 animals in captivity. Um, there's 32 males and 29 females. We've had some really low reproductive success in the last few years, and we're not quite sure why. If you have a sliding scale of hardy lemurs to really sensitive, they fall on the most sensitive side of the lemurs. Um, they're really difficult to keep in captivity, to keep well, and they often fall uh, ill to many intestinal issues and can die very suddenly before you even get to know they're ill. They hide their illnesses really well. But basically, learn and deciding and learning how to and who to breed every year is sort of like looking at how many rooms you have in your hotel. So you can't squeeze a lot of animals into small spaces for many obvious reasons. So if we're full, if our hotel is full, we have to slow down our breeding. If we don't have other institutions come on board to house these animals, we have to slow down the breeding. We house more, we house half the population here at this center and the other half is spread between 12 other institutions. And we're about to do a planning session this December because we've had a few adults die and we've shipped a few to other countries. So now we're looking at what we have as our breeding population here sure. to see who our best pairings are. So when, when you are uh, trying to breed two lemurs, you have two lemurs and you're hoping that they're going to pre produce some offspring, like how do you create the conditions for that to happen? What's the lemur equivalent of lighting some candles and having a romantic dinner? <laughs> uh, well, it's not as easy as you think. Lots of species are quite easy to breed depending on the actual taxa. Some animals are not easy to breed. You have to have, the animals have to have the right diet. They have to be, the female has to be in the right reproductive health and cycling. Um, if she's not cycling, obviously she's not ovulating. So we have to make sure they're at least old enough to be reproductive. The males are appropriate, appropriately old enough to be reproductive. And then we do introductions of new pairings to make sure they're compatible. Almost all the time they're compatible, but sometimes there's just a few animals that just just don't mesh. Because this is a female dominant species, does it come down to, to whether the female decides that the male is kind of worthy of mating with? Is that how the process Pretty works? much, yeah. And in some of the other persimian species, it, they require that the males fight over her and she has to watch them, for, for example, in mouse lemurs. In Chicago Shafak, they're certainly the, probably the one of the most dominant female species that we have in the lemur family. And yeah, if she doesn't like the male, he needs to run away. And there's only a two days out of the year that she's receptive. So 24 to 48 hours, she only cycles twice a year. And one of those times she'll be receptive. She doesn't get pregnant the first time. About 30 to 40 days later, she'll cycle again, most often, usually not a third time. And he gets about 24 to 48 hours, like I said, of time where he has to get in there and breed. And all of a sudden you'll see her sit quietly and she's really nice to him and we go, aha, today's the day. And he'll spend the whole day sort of wooing her and trying to breed with her. Um, but it's a, and then after they're done breeding, she no longer wants anything to do with him. Well, I think there's a lesson for human males in there, right? She doesn't like you, run away. <laughs> run away. Maybe kind of you get, get your tail in. pulled and your, your feet bitten. <laughs> well, so tell us a little bit more about this species over here, because I gather they're now emerging from where they've been feeding in a, in a kind of separate enclosure. Yeah, these are red ruffed lemurs. There's red ruffed and black and white lemurs are essentially genetically the same, they, but they have different color variations like this. Red ruff lemurs are critically endangered species. They live in a very small area in Madagascar, separated by a river from the rest of the black and white ruff lemurs. At that river border, there are some crossbreeding and there's like tri-colored black, white, and red lemurs, which is sort of unusual, but happens in nature from time to time where you have two species sort of overlapping. Sure. Um, but the black and white lemurs are endangered, but the red ruffs are really critically endangered because of their small area. They're beautiful, they're bigger bodied animals than some of the others, closer to what you might see in an Indri weight-wise, although Indri are much bigger. Um, so the factors in, in critical endangerment, is that come, is it a combination of population size and area that they have to roam in? Exactly, yeah. It's the number of animals that are left over and the type of habitat they have that they might survive in. It also depends on the genetic diversity in those small areas. Um, you might find a healthy population in terms of numbers, but they're all so closely related that there's no way that's going to work out long term. So those are all the factors that come in together. So logistically here at the center, I see that you have uh, the, the lemurs feeding separately so the larger ones can't bully the smaller ones away from their food. Sometimes but, it's the other way around. Oh really? <laughs> well I can see Loopy bullying anybody. She, I'd give her my dinner if she wanted it. Because you see I'm the squirrel gonna... displacing her on I the did, tree? I did, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> it was amazing to be able to see that. And that's what I was going to ask about. Like outside of feeding, to what extent do, do, do the lemurs have separate um, enclosures that they roam around in here? or? Um, 
They do. How so much we do you have to keep them apart during their natural kind of day to day existence. In the natural habitat areas that we have here at the center, we have nine of them. They range from one and a half acres to 14 acres. And even though they're really large ones, we can only have one family of each species. Like you can't have two families of red roofs lemurs in the same area, even though it's really large, because they end up fighting. So it's really just not big McCoy enough. Situation. Yeah, right. it's just never large enough. Uh, they would just fight and either drive them over the fences or really injure each other. So we usually try to make sure that all of our cockerel shafak are free ranging uh, because they are sort of obligate folivores that need to graze all the time. It's good for their healthy gut environment. Right. And whoever meshes with the cockerel shafak is usually ring-tailed lemurs. Um, rough lemurs are a bit bossy depending on where they are and who they're with. Um, we also have red-fronted lemurs free-ranging. We've had crown lemurs free-ranging. So it really depends who's compatible. If they are not 100% reliable for their lockups, they also don't get to free-range. So they have to make sure they come into a, a lockup situation on a command whenever we need them to. And if they can't do that, they're not reliable to free range. So I know obviously you have to manage the lemur population here very carefully. You have to manage interaction with the lemurs very carefully because they're, they're so vulnerable. So I would imagine in your position, you must form a fair amount of attachment to, to, to these animals. Like how does that kind of work for you? Do you develop certain affection for them? Like, I know they all have their individual names. Are there certain lemurs that you're more fond of? How do their personalities come out? Oh, sure. If you ask anybody working in this field with animals, there's always a trust and relationship that they build up with the animals they work with. And uh, there are times where we have to transfer those beloved animals to other institutions for the good of the internal breeding programs, the captive breeding propagation. So it's hard when they die, if they get ill or they have to be euthanized. That's also very very difficult. I think we all have favorites. I keep vowing that I won't. I think I only have one favorite left that I'm allowing myself to be attached to that way. Um, but because we live so much longer than them, it's really difficult to see them when they go or when they die. Um, the shorter to live long ones, even the small ones are the fantastic animals, really hard not to get to know them on a personal level. And when they let you into their social group, so to speak, you feel like you're part of their family. So, so when that happens, what are some of the, some of the behaviors uh, in which their personalities manifest themselves to you? Well, we do a lot of operant conditioning training here, and that takes a lot of trust. Um, it's easy to train animals into kennels or onto scales for husbandry, uh, things that we need from them to make sure they're healthy. But when you need to remove an infant from an animal, um, when, when it's clinging to mom, there's some of us and some relationships and some species that we can voluntarily remove that animal, that baby from the mother. So that's a real trusting relationship. Um, other things are like putting on radio collars voluntarily. Uh, I know Brittany, the primary keeper for these species can do that with these red rough lemurs and they sit there and they allow her to collar and uncollar. And we're talking about wild animals. These are not domesticated sure. animals. They might be habituated to us, but they're in no way domesticated. So building that trust takes a lot. How do you manage to maintain that line? As you say, you're wanting to preserve them as wild animals, um, and yet you must obviously interact with them and build trust for the kind of things that you're talking about. So what kind of procedures do you use to, to make sure that you're not kind of getting too close or preserving that wild animal nature? Yeah, we're pretty good and, and we're pretty firm about our hands-off policy in terms of we don't pet the animals, we don't pick them up, we don't let them ride around on our shoulders. We feel that those of really inappropriate behaviors for wild animals to do with human beings. But on the flip side, we want to be able to touch them for any medical or husbandry reasons, like checking a cut on the hand, or we have an animal who will open our, his mouth for us to look into, or removing an infant, or going through the fur if there's a laceration. So we have to have some sort of connection with the animal to do that. But for the most part, we stand back and let them be. We don't call them by name outside of a auditory cue to get them into their enclosure and it's not their name but it's actual sound that they're used to hearing. Um, so things like that we have to be careful and walk that fine line because we have a lot of researchers coming here that want to see them behave as if they're in the wild sure. and we have to maintain that. So to ask an obvious question, but to get it in your words, um, all the study and, and conservation work that you do here at the center, how does that benefit the lemurs that are left out in the wild? Well, gosh, that's a huge question. And there's so many ways. Uh, what we learn here in captivity helps us to understand what the animals are doing in the wild and vice versa. And that helps overall long-term so that we know what foods they need 
what trees we need to replant perhaps in Madagascar, what is critical endangered habitat for them, for animals that are, some animals like these are nesters, they need certain types of forest habitat to nest their babies, whereas the Shafak carry their babies where they are. So those, those differences that we learn about their infant care is important for their survival in captivity and in the wild. Um, we have evolutionary anthropology de uh, department here at Duke that does a lot of, a lot of work because these guys are pro-simians, pre-monkeys, and they're sort of like the gap in between, you know, a primate world that's advanced and one that's very primitive. Sure. Um, so there's lots of ways that we can sort of cross-train each other from wild and captive populations. So these, these two here, are they just basically waiting to be let back into the rooms where they're going to hang out? What, this, this, the feeding is over, right? And they know that? That's essentially where we are? Pretty much. Rough lemurs are couch potatoes. As a matter of fact, most of the animals here, um, I would say a good 75% of the animals that are free-ranging, when it's too hot, too cold, too windy or rainy, they want to lie inside and watch TV, so to speak. They sure. want to come into the enclosures. These animals are locked out of the enclosure because if we allow them to sit inside all day, that's what they would do. They can come in at night, we open the gates, but we want them to be out in the habitat, using the habitat, and not just sitting on the shelf. So they're just bored, and they'll, as soon as we leave, they'll probably go back out into the forest. So they're not so different from teenagers, in nope. that if they were <laughs> able to stay in their room with the door shut all day, that's what they would do. Some of them, yeah, some of them for sure. And then there's some that want to be out in the enclosures all the time, so. It really depends on the species and the individual family. Can you tell us <laughs> okay, they sounded pretty upset just then. I, I know there was a noise somewhere off. Is so that I think true? the male is still out there, and these are the two females, and he called to them, and they're calling back. Oh, so, I see. Because yeah. I was thinking that there was something that happened, and it had really distressed them, but that wasn't... Well, uh... it depends. So that contact call, or that alarm call, is so many different ways. You, he's, she's sunning herself now. Wow. Um, it's a beautiful day. Oh, it's a fantastic That's day. Right. So if we bad. drop our keys or if our radio goes off, they'll make that sound. So okay. if they're disturbed, alarmed, or someone calls to them, they'll call back, but for a number of other reasons as well. So presumably you can tell from the tone of the call as to whether it's something they're really distressed about mm. or they're just replying to something, or is it, how easy is that to discern? That particular call is always similar. The males have the lower part of the call. They always call together, and the females have... Sorry, the males have the higher portion of that call, the females have the lower portion of the call, but that call is really hard to determine different pitches. They have other sounds that they make, other vocalizations that we sort of guess what they make and we feel like we're right most of the time. They have a low growl, they have a hum, they have a hoot. Sure. Um, they have a, you know, exhale of air and those things all mean different things. Right, absolutely. So to what extent are the, these red rough lemurs um, female dominant? I know we had the shafaks are very, very female dominant. Is that the case with this species too? Pretty much, yeah. Um, the only co-dominance that we really have a clear understanding of are things like colored lemurs. Sometimes the small fat-tailed dwarf lemurs can be co-dominant as well, where it's unclear on an any given day, especially in breeding season, who the dominant one is. But for the most part, the rest of the lemurs are pretty female dominant. So it's entirely possible that when that male just called and the females called back, they were like, hush, stop bothering me, I'll let you know when I want to hear from you. Perhaps, but more likely it's there. He's like, where'd you go? And they're like, we're over here. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, no, it's I'm probably more likely. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so, you never know. Sure. Um, if I promise not to tell any lemurs, can you tell me if you have a favorite among all the species that you have here? <laughs> uh... And I can appreciate sure. that from day to day. So my favorite species, obviously, um, is uh, Shafak. My favorite individual passed away, but uh, his, oh, her grandchildren are still around. And I'm really fond on, of the grandchildren that she has. And one of them is Felix. So I was going to ask if Felix was one of the guys. He's a favorite of a lot of people here. He was one of the babies that was born a little early, actually within season, but earlier than the rest of them. And oh, wow. he's a pretty fantastic personality. Uh, born to, and his dad is the youngest male who was ever conceived before, so he's an unusual data point for us, but he's lovely. I also enjoy a red rough lemur called Buzz, who actually is just right up there with some of the Shafak, and he doesn't live out here, he lives in another enclosure, he's pretty fantastic. 
Well, so you mentioned, um, you know, about the, the breeding program and all the different factors that go into deciding when and how to, to breed. But I mean, so what are the chances that um, Felix, for example, might get to breed here and you might have another generation of, of Felix his ear? Or does it all depend on what the needs are of the species at a given time? Well, right now our population is, uh, we're trying to reach a population of about 85 animals and we're at 61. So his chances are huge about it breeding okay. when he becomes sexual maturity, which is around until Gabe came along, somewhere around four, he was a little, he was younger than that. But yeah, very good chances. He comes from a really strong line of genes, so it's it's very good that he'll have a chance to breed with a female in the future. So if that were the, the case, would it be likely that it would be a female here that he would breed with, or as you say, you would go into the program and you would find a compatible female somewhere else that would Correct. maybe come here? Correct. Correct. If he is a really good match with another an animal at another zoo, we would transfer him out or bring her in if we had space. And so I guess who gets transferred depends entirely on the space at the particular institution. Space and compatibility of sure. the institution, yeah. Yeah, there's a number of things that go into that, and that's certainly two of the most important ones. So you mentioned here that these, these red rough lemurs, you're not letting them back into their rooms because they just sit there and chill, but so how long will they stay out here in the forest in their enclosure just hanging out today? Well, it depends on the day if the weather's really nice. Uh, once it gets warm down here, they'll probably move up into the forest where it's cooler. Um, it depends when they start getting hungry for their afternoon diet. They might hang out around down here. Um, and in the evening, they get to come in at night. Wow, so it really depends on the individuals. These groups are actually, this group is actually pretty good about staying out in the woods. Well, this has been fantastic. We have been here at the Duke Lima Center for World Lima Day. We're getting ready to sign off here. Thank you so much for joining us. And who knows, maybe we'll have another opportunity to do a Duke Social Media Live from somewhere almost as adorable as this. I've been Greg Phillips for Duke Communications. Thanks so much. By working together, we can help save lemurs from extinction. You can adopt a lemur at lemur.duke.edu.adopt. You can't snuggle your lemur or take it home, but you'll be supporting their care at Duke and in Madagascar, and you'll get regular updates on your lemur's progress.